already uh, in January about uh, our service management, uh, new survey uh, research. And uh, he will talk uh, about uh, comparative study of service management, new survey, uh, some kind of the uh, midterm report, uh, what uh, his team is doing. And, uh, okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay. Is it on? Good. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> as Professor Anikawa already mentioned, I gave a presentation in January about this uh, comparative study on service operations. I just give today a short update on where is the project right now. So that's the purpose of today's uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, the content is first a short recap of the most important statements of the last presentation. So for the ones to recall and for the new ones to get a picture on where we are. Then the next part is the actual service benchmarking study, the survey structure. And I will talk a little bit more in details about service workflow, about travel efforts, as I also will use spare parts uh, as a simple example to show how we can um, reduce or limit the number of questions in the survey. Um, then a short sli one slide just on the timeline of the project, a short introduction of the team, and then I will wrap up the whole presentation. So, the recap of the previous presentation. I started with the question, what does innovation mean? Is innovation always the same for everybody? And the answer was, <clears throat> innovation is a new idea, um, could be a more effective device, or could be a more effective process. However, this is for everybody different. So we have another condition, and this means innovation depends also on the start line. A simple example I showed last time, when I take my mobile phone, it's an old one, you have to flip it open and compare it with a smartphone. And if I buy a smartphone, it's already innovation for me, because I make a big step forward in terms of functionality. So the start line is a very important part, and this is also the reason why we do the service benchmarking study, to see where the industry uh, stands currently. Here are a few examples of, uh, of services. It starts with a waiter in a hotel, the Takyo bins, a consultant, a teacher, professor who gives lectures and things like this. This is all a service, because a service is an activity done by someone for somebody, for someone else. This someone could be a company, this could be an individual person like me, like you. Yeah? So, but in this project, we only look to this kind of service done by a company. So, it's the installation of a machine, it's a repair of a machine or a system or a device, however you call it, um, and then the maintenance of such systems and devices, as well as advising on a better or correct usage of the systems or software which is involved. So we look only in that study to this type of service, not to the other ones. <clears throat> Here, uh, the, first of all, the participants, they come from basically a broad range of industry sectors. Here are just a few listed. It starts from the automotive industry, call center, machinery, plant, engineering, and uh, yeah, lower downs, professional kitchen devices, even uh, telecommunication, etc. So the broad range of industry where such services are done will be approached. Now, because we want to do it uh, this time in an international way, we have also to look at the origin of countries. We want to do the study here in Japan with 50% of Japanese companies and 50% of Japanese subsidiaries of foreign companies. From wherever they come around the world, they have subsidiaries here and so they are a candidate for this. And the comparison in the, on, in the international way is we take Germany, there we look for 50% German companies and 50% companies who are foreign in, in Germany. So basically we later on can compare data. <clears throat> Now, um, the real um, service benchmarking study and the survey structure. 
first of all, you see here the structure. And <clears throat> around the central element, you see nine groups of questions to which we look at. The first, uh, the first group, the general question on top, this is where we just ask, what is your industry sector? Where do, where's your headquarter located? And how important is service for your sales operation? Hmm? Uh, in the next part, we look already at the service organization. How is it managed? Is it managed under sales? Is it a parallel line of, of, of management? How much staff is there in the service operation and how much staff is also in the sales operation to compare? Hmm? Very often, we have quite a lot of staff in, uh, in, the sales at, uh, in the sales department, but not enough in the, uh, in the service department. And then you look across the industries, you can see a kind of a relationship that should be uh, uh, relatively the same. So, next, the next part is the service workflow. Let me skip this here for a moment. I will get back to you. Uh, I get back to this topic in a separate slide. The same, I also for spare parts, stock and logistics, as well as install base. Here I have some separate slides for you. Now let's look to skills and training. <clears throat> An engineer needs to learn, or a service technician needs to learn how to do his work. And this learning needs to be evaluated just after the lecture or after the training and then ongoingly. What's his quality? How can he be improved? You know, when I was a service manager, I always checked regularly who is my slowest performing engineer. And this guy was not a bad engineer. He just was the slowest. If you have two, one is fast and the other is slow. It's always the same game. Yeah? So the slowest engineer got into training and became a faster one. Next year, another one was slower. By doing so, I could push up the level of the entire team. So training evaluation is very important. Also career paths. We need to understand what kind of career paths do the companies provide to their engineers. Because um, an engineer who leaves a company takes an incredible amount of knowledge uh, with him or with her. Yeah? So it's very important that companies offer the engineers, also the service technicians, service engineers, a career path to grow. The typical pattern is a specialist level one, specialist level two, specialist level three. Because service engineers are not the typical person who wants to go into management. One also needs service management. So we need to understand how uh, here are service managers selected. What are the criteria the companies use? So this is what we cover here under the, the topic of skills, training, and career paths. And the next topic is contracts and pricing. You might have heard very often that service operations have red figures. I'm not surprised about this because the performance is not so good, so the prices cannot be high enough. You know? Or the costs are just too high, and from top, the market pressure, and from beneath, they have the cost pressure. So if they have, don't work efficient, they have high costs, and this means profits go down or, uh, or the, the whole operation gets red. Also about contracts, we need to understand what kind of contracts are offered. Very often I hear, especially in Japan, oh, we just sell contracts 5% uh, uh, below the price. What means a contract being sold 5% the, the price? What is the 100% value? You know? This is very often understood, we just give you a discount. You know? But there's not a real comparison. So we want to understand what's going on here in contracts. What contracts are offered? We have five plus one dimensions in service contracts. How many dimensions are really used? This is what we understand here also, or want to understand here under this um, <clears throat> question group of contracts and pricing. Then it comes to customer requirements and satisfaction. Almost all service operations, once in a while, run a kind of a customer satisfaction survey. But when you look at these surveys, you all very often see that the questions and answers are not enabling enhancement uh, activities. You can ask the company, are you happy with, with, uh, with our service from one to five, yeah? And then you get an answer from one to five. But what can you do with such an answer? If it's very good, you can slap on your shoulder and say, we have a good service operation. If it's not good, what can you do? What, can, what can, if information can you take out of that? So we need to understand here what kind of questions are asked, how structured are they asked, how regularly are they asked. You know? So this is about customer satisfaction. And customer requirements, 
typical situation is even worse. Yeah? When you ask the companies where do you get your customer requirements, most often you just get an answer like, we are just from conversation with a salesman or what the service engineer tells us when he comes home and things like this. It's not really structured. But if you really go to your customer and ask and understand what are the requirements for their, for their operation, you will actually come up uh, with an interesting element. You can create contracts, you can create services which match the requirements. Yeah? By doing so, you make your customer happy and you also can gain money on this because you have a special service offered for you, for, uh, for your clients, for your customers. Then the next question block is enhancement situation. So here, uh, we want to understand how open are companies for in, in, in respect to enhancing their operations. Hmm? Very often we see, or I've seen uh, uh, in, in uh, kind of questionnaires, a, a big discrepancy about information about the service organization and enhancement situation. In the first part, when I ask the question, this is what I typically do, how good do you evaluate your service operation? Most of them are good or very good. When it comes to the enhancement situation, yeah, the ones, the person who filled in the survey went through all these questions and then they recognized, oh, we have a big enhancement potential. How can it be that you have a, a great service operation and you have a great enhancement potential? No? So there is a discrepancy in between. And I'm uh, quite curious about how this will be when we really go on, a, on, on, on such a broad base of that survey here. So now, <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah. Now I want to come to the topic of service workflow. We'll explain a little bit more what is it and what, what we, do we understand. Let me just show you a short animation. Customer calls, somebody grabs the phone, answers the phone, and then a technician grabs his toolbox, yeah, runs to the customer, fixes the machine, and at the end, the service manager writes a bill. This story I was told since many, many years. I basically created that sequence here in 2005 um, for a presentation at the uh, Association for Service Managers International in Prague in the Czech Republic. 2005, I created that sequence of, of uh, animation. This is valid today. Yeah? Even to try to get these things, why do you think the process is so complex? It's very simple, it's just like this. But the, now it comes when we, when we look at who is taking the call, where is the call taken, and how is the information somehow locked that it does not get lost. Current studies show consistently that most often the service technicians take calls themselves. Now I ask the question, where is the service technician supposed to be? Sitting in the office and waiting for a phone call? No, I don't think so. A service technician should be at a customer's place or should work on a customer's machine. That's when the service technician makes money and that's the only time a service engineer makes money. Hmm? So, where is, the, where is such a, a person the, the second most uh, or longest time uh, of his daily work? Driving from one customer to another. Can he take a call and write down information when he drives a car? It's a bit difficult steering a wheel like this, steering a car like this in traffic. Yeah. But this happens. And then the information is maybe in the brain of the, uh, of the technicians, but it's not locked in a system where a system can supervise the whole process. So here, a lot of questions to be asked to understand just the call taking, one part of, uh, of the process. <clears throat> and the next one is, it's again a who does it and where is it done question. The diagnostic of the problem. Who finds out what's wrong with the system? No? Typically, it's done over the phone. This is the most common uh, uh, and, and most sensible thing. If you go to advanced technologies, you can log into the system or you can have uh, log files downloaded and sent to you so you can analyze this. No? This cannot be done by a technician who drives a car or by a technician who just works at the, uh, the competitor side. So it's very important that this uh, to understand who is doing where the diagnostic of the problem. And with the diagnostic of the problem is the spare parts connected. Who checks the spare parts availability? Are they there? Yeah? 
um, because if you don't have spare parts, you cannot make an appointment. And the appointment is again a story. Who does the appointment? Do you need a technical expertise of a technician to make an appointment with a customer? I would say no. I very often said, if I can't do it, an administrative person can do it. You don't need a technical expertise to make an appointment with a customer. So, it's also a question, who and where is this done? By the way, most often uh, in Japan, the engineers are doing that. This is burning cash. An engineer costs 12,000 yen an hour. There's a good value for Japan, and an administrative person costs 5,000, 6,000 yen an hour. So this is burning cash, what I'm seeing here. Spare parts and delivery and the pickup. Where, where does the engineer and the spare parts meet? That's an important part. The moment an engineer has to drive one kilometer to pick up spare parts, it's already a loss. It's a loss in time and a loss in, in, uh, in money. You know? So the, the spare parts and the delivery must be optimized in a flow that it meets the, the engineer at, the, at an ideal point. The best point is starting to get a customer, but there are other uh, possibilities also, and we want to understand how is it done. I'm very curious if we get one answer here in Japan on overnight delivery into the car of an engineer. This is, the most, uh, is one of the, the, the best ways to deliver spare parts to an engineer. The engineer sleeps, the truck driver comes, opens the car, puts in the new spare parts for the next day, and returns automatically the unused spare parts of the day before. Because engineers typically have a few spare parts more than they need. And this is very, very sensible. You know? Because it, you cannot charge 100% is it this or this on the phone. So you take this, this, and maybe another one. But the ones you don't need needs to be returned immediately because otherwise your stock goes up. Every spare part which is in the car of, a, of, an, of an technician is a dead part. Cannot be used by somebody else. You know? So you need to increase the stock for the other engineer. So that's also an important element which we try to understand what is the situation. And then when it comes to, um, <clears throat> to traveling, are the engineers traveling directly from home? Or do they travel by other ways? I'll come back to this in, an, in an, uh, one of the next slides again. The training is done. How is it done? I mentioned it already. And how often and how are skills evaluated? If there is a proper service management system implemented, the evaluation of an, of an service engineer from his technical skill side is done with a click of three, five buttons, something like that. You have the information. You have a listing, a ranking of your engineers per machine type, etc. But you have to have um, a state-of-the-art service management system in place, including a proper process. Otherwise, your data don't, uh, don't, uh, do not make sense. Now, the writing of the bill. There's always the story, sale says, it has to be free of charge because I want to sell a new system. That could be a very important statement. It could be a very important thing that this service is given free of charge for the customer because sales will sell a big system the next day. However, these costs must be recorded by salesmen because otherwise the salesman give everything free of charge just to get a lot of bonus when they make a good turnover. I know these cases. I, have, I found them very often. It's very common. So the information needs to be locked. This is something which we want to understand. How far can sales go in giving service free of charge? And how is that information locked? Or is it locked at all? So uh, it's a complex question which we have to deal here with. And then, also, an important part is how long does it take to send out a bill? Basically, a bill can be sent out within 48 hours comfortably. With modern systems, you can make it in 24. But let's say 48 hours. There are companies where it takes a month until the service bill goes out. It could be sometimes so long until a bill gets out that one forgets what it was. A few years ago, I lived in Belgium. I had to go to the university hospital uh, in Belgium. And I got half a year, nine months later, a bill from the hospital. I thought, what is that? Oh, I remember. I was there. So getting the bill half a year to nine months later, this is a lot of loss in money. So 
Now let's go, let me go back. And let me now go to um, install base and workload and travel effort. This is basically the locations where an engineer is. He's at home, there is an office, and there are customers, one, two, three, four, could be more. The basic pattern is, or the best pattern is, the engineer travels from home directly to a customer, customer number one. From there, he travels to customer number two, and then he travels home. That's obvious yeah, when you look at this here. But the reality typically looks like this. The engineer travels from home to the office, has a cup of coffee, chats with his colleagues, takes the spare parts, and then travels to the customer. Now, thinking about travel times in Japan, one and a half, two hours, three hours, quickly done on traveling. So from the customer, he goes back to the office. By then, it's already late afternoon. So he can be a little bit more in the office, kill the time, and go home. The chance to go to a second customer uh, back from the office and then back to the office again is already small. So what is now the real situation? We have these two extreme patterns here. This is something which we want to find out here about the, uh, the travel effort of engineers. Now, there is also another topic, and this is the location of the engineers. Where are the engineers located? And you see a map of Japan with the typical places for service stations. Sapporo, Sendai, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, uh, and uh, Fukuoka. These are the typical patterns. Hmm? Until now, I have not seen a service operation which does an optimized location of the technicians. An optimized location of the technicians can be calculated. You have areas with height. This is a service area of an engineer. You can define this, whatever it is. You need to look at your map. It's individual. So you have here clusters of, of customers or systems with a high demand. You have one with a medium demand, and you have one with a low demand. And based on that, you can calculate uh, the location of your engineer. In this case, it's indicated somewhere here. This can be calculated. Can you always put an engineer in this point? No. You cannot always, because there could be a lake. This could be the middle of a lake, so you can't put it there. The point is, put it as close as possible to that point. But if you have it far away, if that engineer is, for example, located somewhere here, wasting time, every day wasting time. So try to move your engineer into uh, close to that point. This can be calculated. And this can be, even if you pay the moving of the engineer and his family into this point, this could be at the end cheaper for you because of the daily travel costs you have. So this is also something which you want to find out. How much is the standard locations and how much is it really optimized? Now, <clears throat> we go back. Um, yeah, and now we come back to the spare parts and logistics. Here, I uh, want to use this just to <clears throat> give a very simple, very, very simple example on how we reduce or limit the number of questions in the survey. Basically, what you have here is a stream of questions. You come from the previous question to, in this case, group three, question four. You have a bunch of answers. And then you have another question, which is how is the availability of spare parts determined? And here you basically have four answers to be selected. The first one, it's measured regularly. The next one is, we just estimate it. We don't really measure it. The first one is, we don't know at all. And the fourth question is, I don't know at all. So the person who answers the, uh, the survey can also say, I don't know. Yeah? Now, the reduction can be done here uh, in that way that we only ask these two, in these two cases, we ask, what is the percentage of availability? Yeah? And for the other ones here, we don't need to ask that question because they don't know it. Yeah? So, so in this case, it's just one step to the next question. But we have questions in die where we jump over a bunch of, of questions to the next point. By doing so, we really can reduce the number of, uh, of questions to be asked and to be uh, answered by the participants. Because the point is, the survey has to be as short as possible. It has to contain everything we need. 
And this is a balance which needs to be done. So the timeline, we have started already uh, with the project. <clears throat> and the first uh, thing is by March 25th, we want to have the, the survey, uh, the questions, and the design ready. This means we know exactly which questions we ask, what is the logic in it, and what are the possible answers. Then uh, until the end of March, the translations, because we need the survey in English, in Japanese, and in German. Then comes a, a, a period where we have to work very often. Uh, we can do this one here already, but we cannot do it there. So we have to contact the chambers of commerce, all uh, kinds of, of uh, industry associations, get access to, to uh, um, companies who are organized there, and then approach the companies with emails, etc. Et, et and also letter of recommendations in the emails. By May 1st, we want to and the collection of the data. And then um, mid-May, uh, the survey analysis. And then we will start in uh, June writing the reports based on what we have. Writing the reports is also something where you have to go back into the survey analysis. Because when you write something, you have to think a little bit deeper about it. As you suddenly realize, oops, we should find out what is it in this case. So this is kind also of interactive, uh, going a little bit forth and back. So now, this was the timeline. The team, there's first of all Yang, uh, Yang Tao Gyu, she is sitting there. And the other two gentlemen, unfortunately not here, uh, Chihiro Taguchi from Keio University, and also um, 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 Shotaro, also from uh, Hirano, from, also from Keio University. Basically, what we have here is a winning team. I'm very happy to be, uh, to be able to work with these uh, three persons here. Summary, let me quickly wrap it up. First, I had a short recap of the situation. Innovation means something new, nothing improved. But in order to understand the degree of innovation, we need to understand also what is the start line, the baseline of it. Then when it comes to the survey structure, we have a, a system of nine groups of questions covering all aspects of a service operation. In terms of workflow, the most important part is this for a service operation. Um, I explained what it is, the simple way, but the reality, it is more, much more complex than it is um, shown in this uh, animation. Travel efforts, the basic patterns, what is the real one? And then uh, again, also here, the location, where are the engineers located, etc. So this is also something we need to understand. I use the spare parts as an example, how to short the logic by uh, looking at answers. And the timeline I presented, reports will be done in June. And I also introduced the team. Thank you very much for your attention on that short update of the project. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Stapp. I got a question. Uh, could you tell me the rationale for choosing Japan and Germany? The I'm rationale? Gonna, uh, no, no, let's, let's yeah. continue. Yeah. Uh, it's good. Probably my concern is two nationals, too similar about culture and industrial culture, probably service yeah. culture. Yeah. And now. Uh, the uh, rationale behind yes. this question is very simple. I am German, yes, I guess and so. Ying Tao is yeah. almost a German. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? So she's, she's, uh, she's native speaking, a native yeah. speaker in German. Yeah. So we have a strong connection. And also, uh, it's, it's really uh, not more like this. I'm a German. I have very good connections with the Chamber of Commerce here in Japan. Yeah. I was also vice president there. So I have very good introduction into, into German good. Chambers of Commerce. And uh, by doing so, we get resources. You know when you want to get something, you need connections. Yes. That's, so I hope that you get... But on the, the other side, also Japan and Germany, you can compare it. Yeah, High -tech yes, countries. compare it. Yeah. However, I Perfectly. suggest you yeah. uh, extend your research to yeah. uh, some other cultures, yeah. right? Yeah. The U.S. is okay. Yeah. Yeah. More fragmented, yeah. probably. And cultural aspects, we also can look at, but see if... It, do we identify cultural aspects? Yeah? I'm living since 30 years in Japan, so I also know a little bit about the Japanese cultures. Hmm? 
Yeah. So you ask a question and answer it yourself, please. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I actually, I just want to edit up a comment to the census. Ah, uh, here, yeah. I'm sorry about the name. Uh, so actually, Professor Tanaka. Tanaka says, yeah. Okay. So actually, um, the idea came up with German compar comparative study because of Anegawa Sensei, because we were doing one research on my stay here in Keio on on, on service industry. Um, comparisons. So Anigawa Sensei just suggest, suggested us to do a study in Germany also because he's interested in German service um, because he was in Germany like in last year. So that's why we came up to this idea to compa mm -hmm. compare Germany <coughs> specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Service is terrible. <laughs> no more questions. So there will be a next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me grab also the chance to thank you, Professor Anegaba, for all your support on this project. Yeah. We, we had many discussions about it, and he was the one who uh, um, got Ying Tao and me together. Okay. So, very good. Very great support. I really appreciate that, Professor Anikawa. So we will continue the discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. So, uh, uh, in Japanese. <laughs> で、こういうサービスグローバルサのキーワードについて説明いたしますと この話を含めながら、それから教育と健康、先ほど健康という話、あるいは長寿の話が出ましたけれども、教育と長寿とイノベーションと、まあこういくつかのキーワードを設定しながら来年度のプログラムに取り組みたいと思います。4月5月、6